Hello, and welcome to our program, Astronomy for Everyone. The topic for this month's program is the Starlink Communication Satellite Constellation. Is that an issue for astronomers? With me here to talk about this topic are Tim Campbell, to my immediate left, and next to Tim, we have Gordon Hansen, both members of the Ford Amateur Astronomy Club, and they've both been with us on the show before. Gentlemen, welcome back. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Now, this is an interesting topic, and I want to get this part out first. Uh, we have a, uh, a URL, a mm -hmm. link to a 15-minute YouTube video that uh, I think is, uh, really helps explain the basic issue. And uh, Tim, you had sent that out to us, mm -hmm. so I wanted to share that with our viewers right away so that they can take advantage of that. So this Starlink communication satellite constellations, that one and others, basically what are they? So Starlink is an um, internet communication system mm -hmm. uh, that's put out by um, SpaceX, e Elon Musk. And what he hopes to do is cover the planet with satellites in relatively low altitude, uh, low enough that they can do easy internet communication to remote parts of the planet. Uh, but the money maker for him is that he can do very high speed communication for transatlantic communications that will be faster than even fiber under the ocean floor. So that's the, the whole purpose of it is essentially internet communication. All right, and uh, about how many are they looking at? Oh, well, so they've got a few hundred up now. I think we're up to 300 that are in orbit. Uh, but the goal is to put, I think, a total of 12,000 of these things in orbit by the time the entire constellation of satellites is up and working. And this is just for the SpaceX Starlink? Correct. Okay. And I understand that there are other companies who want yes. to get into the... Mm -hmm. uh, so okay. uh, Jeff Bezos uh, wants to do some stuff, and uh, I think the Chinese want to do some stuff. Uh, the, the number, if everybody gets approval uh, over the next 10 years, the numbers will be staggering. So do I, we... I've heard a thing, about 50,000 by the year 2025. 50,000 50, satellites. Because I was... Well, and that doesn't count the stuff that's already up there. Mm -hmm. So right. that would add, add to that as well. Um, how do they keep these things from crashing? Do they have different altitudes? Yeah. So, yeah, so the Starlink system are autonomous. So think of, you know, Teslas that are self-driving cars. These are self-driving satellites. So each one of these satellites has a type of ion propulsion drive system uh, called a krypton drive, and that's because they actually use krypton, the element on the periodic table, as the propulsion system. And so they launch them in a lower orbit, and then those drives uh, slowly space the satellites out and take them into a higher altitude. They have a useful service limit of, I believe, five years, and then they need to be deorbited. So they will actually bring themselves out of orbit uh, when they're getting to the end of their service life, but they will be replaced by new satellites that will take their place. And when these things are deorbited, do they just burn up in the atmosphere? Uh, not all of them, but much of them, most of them burn up. There are a few bits that are expected to survive, uh, so they try and deorbit them so those things will crash into the ocean and not hurt Things anybody. like silicone yeah. and... I, yeah. yeah. Wow. Um, well, what about the other satellites? We've got geostationary, we've got weather, we've got ISS. Uh, yeah, so there's um, about 20,000 things that NORAD tracks um, in Earth orbit right now. Okay. About uh, maybe just shy of 5,000 of those things are satellites that actually work, uh, but there are a number of satellites up there that no longer work, uh, that they can't really deorbit those things. There's space junk up there. There are spent rocket boosters uh, that are up there. Um, and their altitudes are all over the place. So a low altitude might be as, as low as 200 miles. Uh, geostationary uh, satellites are just over 22,000 miles uh, out beyond the Earth. Uh, they orbit uh, in a string above Earth's equator. So those aren't going all over the planet up and down. They have to remain at that point so they appear not to move in the sky. Okay. But those are the highest ones. Uh, but there are uh, many ranges in between. Okay, so the altitudes do vary, mm -hmm. and the ISS, is that sort of sandwich itself in between? Yeah, I think the ISS uh, in rough round numbers is around 250 miles. That's a relatively low orbit. Okay, so it would be just above this network of satellites mm -hmm. that they're going to be deploying yeah. for uh, Internet access. Um, 
So altitude, uh, what, why does that figure into it? Is there for coverage? So, uh, so there are a couple of reasons for the altitude. One is uh, to make sure the radio signals don't interfere with each other. So if they were in too high of an orbit, um, too many satellites would be trying to use the same frequency. So you're trying to reduce the total number of satellites uh, that it would be receivable from one spot on the ground at a time. Uh, so a lower orbit is easier to get approval of telecommunications, uh, you know, government agencies. Uh, so for example, the FCC in the United States, uh, but there are other countries involved as well. Um, so they want to make sure there's no interference. Um, also, the antenna that they use, because they want these to be relatively low cost, is something about the size and shape of a pizza box. Um, okay. It's a relatively inexpensive antenna, I'm told around $200. Now, for somebody in certain parts of the world, $200 is an awful lot of money. Um, but that's the idea is uh, because of the low orbit, they don't need particularly strong antennas, they don't need to be particularly expensive, uh, and then they mitigate the radio interference. But that means that they need a lot of these things because they are in low orbit. Uh, there's some good news with the low orbit too. What's that? that? At least to us amateur astronomers, we're only concerned about the satellites when they're visible, and they're only visible when they're in sunlight. So at that low altitude, they're from our perspective on the Earth, they they they, they get into the Earth's shadow a little bit faster, and and we can't see them as far away. So so that's the good news. News good news part. Mm -hmm. All right. So uh, there's some good news, but I understand that there's some brightness issues. Well, there are some brightness issues, yes. So um, uh, any time a satellite, uh, satellites don't actually have working electrical lights on them, they're not airplanes, uh, but they do get lit by sunlight, as, as Gordon mentioned. Um, and so if you are an astronomer and you are taking an image of the night sky and one of these things happens to cross through your path, um, and you would think that this would be a rare occurrence, but it turns out it does happen a lot. Uh, what happens is you get a little streak of light uh, through your image. Now, later on, I think Gordon's going to talk about that. Uh, but that's the, uh, the brightness issue. Now, if it's well behind the Earth, inside the Earth's shadow, no sunlight hits it, so it's not really reflecting back, uh, so we don't really see it. But there is that point where you are in darkness, but the satellite is just off the side of the planet, and it is in the sunlight. And, okay, uh, so, so we're here, satellite's here, so while it's, the shadow's here, there's still residual sunlight right, correct. up up yep. there, and you right. can see it. And it's not just the side of the planet, it could be above the planet, right? So uh, when it's summertime here, so we'll pick the longest day of the year, June 21st, our Earth is tilted 23 and a half degrees. So we're tilted 23 and a half degrees forward. Mm -hmm. Sunlight actually creeps 18 degrees around the horizon. That's what astronomers refer to as astronomical twilight, that time after which there is no residual sunlight making the night sky glow. Uh, so it turns out, depending on where you are on the planet, if you're northern enough, and we in Michigan are, it's actually possible that even in the middle of the night, um, you will actually get these things uh, going through just enough sunlight to be visible, even in the very middle of the night. Now, people elsewhere on the planet won't see that, but we would. Seasonally, change the season, so maybe it's uh, December the 21st, we don't have that issue. Okay. Um, what about their velocity? Well, I think I'm going to talk a little bit about what that is because there's the actual velocity of the satellite, but what is the apparent velocity to us on the Earth? And more importantly, what is the apparent velocity as it passes through our, our, our camera or through our images? So we'll cover that in just yeah, a little bit. Yeah. Brings me to my last question before our break. Uh, what else in the night sky interferes with uh, astro imaging? Mm. Do you want to cover that one? Well, we'll talk about it a little bit later and show some examples, but airplanes, cosmic rays, Satellites that are there, um, um, asteroids very much because they're not going fast enough. We actually we start hunting for those, right? So yeah, yeah oh, there's yeah. lots of things out there that get into our images. We'll so talk a little bit about that. Astronomers have been dealing with this problem for a while. It's just now we're upping the frequency. Yeah, you're putting more things up there to get in the right. way. Then uh, yeah, we would have we would have an issue. Well, it sounds like this is a great place to uh, take our break. Uh, if you uh, would like to send us an email, please do. Uh, you can see that email address down at the bottom of your screen. And coming up next is Term of the Month with Stephen. Thanks, Don. The Term of the Month is Satellite. Now, a satellite is 
just an object that orbits another object. Usually the satellite is much smaller. Now satellites come in two types. Natural satellites are like the Earth's moon, which violates that previous rule about usually much smaller. Uh, the Earth's moon is really quite big. It's one of the biggest moons in the whole uh, solar system. There are six planetary satellite systems in our solar system that we know of uh, with a total of 205 known moons. As of 2018, 334 minor planets, these are basically asteroids, have moons of their own. Now, then we go, back, go to artificial satellites. Sputnik was the very first artificial satellite. It was launched by Russia on October 4th, 1957. Remember back that far? Batteries, the batteries lasted for three weeks, and so it sent out these beeps for three weeks that could be detected on Earth with just a radio. Two months later, it deorbited, and that is the term of the month. Back to you, Don. Thanks, Stephen, and welcome back. We're here in the studio with my two guests. To my immediate left, Tim Campbell, member of the Ford Amateur Astronomy Club, and next to him, Gordon Hansen, also a member of our club. So, uh, Tim, we were just talking real quick about you know, some of the mm -hmm. issues with, with the satellites, like brightness and how we can see them. Mm -hmm. um, it's more of a seasonal thing you were indicating? Um, time of day, but uh, parts of the year, it's actually possible to see them in the very middle of the night. Other parts of the year, it's not. Uh, just your latitude on Earth makes a difference. Ah, okay, all right. So, Gordon, what are the challenges for amateur astronomers with these things flying all over the place? Well, when, I, when this first came up, I was quite frankly said, this isn't going to be such a big deal because things go through our images all the time. So I started out being a bit of a contrarian. So what I tried to do was find a, a Starlink satellite and, and get it on, on image. So the, uh, we've got a, a, an image, th there we go, on the screen now. And this is the streak of a Starlink, Starlink satellite that went, went through one of my images. Just a little bit of background. I set up and started taking three minute exposures. And you can see that little fuzzy thing in the middle. That's a little spher uh, spherical galaxy out, out there. Okay. And uh, it was, I knew the satellite was going to go right by it. And oh, by the way, science is wonderful. That satellite went through right on time and right where it was expected to be. So, Great. So okay. We, uh, so some things we, get, we, can, we can do right. But this, this is a streak. Uh, and if you look at this, you know, it's, and you start comparing it to the stars in this image, and, and I, there's a star... Uh, I, it's kind of hard to point at, but the, 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 the kind of the average star in here is about a ninth magnitude star. So these, this apparent now is a lot dimmer than, than a lot of the stars in the image. Now, now part of it is, is because how fast it's going through. It, it took five seconds for that satellite to go from that upper right corner down to the low, lower left corner. I did a little bit of calculations, and for every pixel that, that it went through, it's, it's about a one three hundredth of a second exposure. So okay. the exposure time, you know, they're going to be bright if, you, if they were sitting in one place, but they're moving pretty fast and they get through the image quickly. So they get quickly. just lighting right. up each pic pixel for right. a very short period But, but that's the concern. These streaks okay. are going to go through our images. So I wound up taking 20 images over this evening, 23-minute images, and after it was done, I went back and now ex examined all 20 images, and you now see four of those images on the screen. And the one in the lower left is that, is that Starlink satellite. Okay. And you now see that there were three other images that had things go through them. There, the upper, uh, upper left on your screen is there's one that's it's kind of a blinking, and I, I suspect that was a high-altitude airplane. I, I did some searching to see if there was any satellites in the area and there weren't any space junk. So I think that was a high-altitude airplane. It was, it's quite faint. It's yeah. faint, but it's in there. And now you can see in the upper right there are two streaks, and those were two other non-Starlink satellites that went through this image. Um, this was a three-minute image, and they probably got through there in, you know, in, in seconds each one. So, but, but I captured two dip, di different satellites through there. In that three-minute time frame. In period. that three-minute time frame. Okay. And in the, bot, in the bottom right image now is an airplane that went through. 
we're close to Metro Airport here, Detroit Metro, and that's a plane going into Metro and it's got its, its landing lights on and its navigation lights. Okay. And so of my 20 exposures, I, I had four, four sets of frames. Now, now, what do we do about them? Okay. You know, in, in, if this was film in the old days, I would have taken one long exposure and I've been trashed. But we're now into the digital world and we have ways to make this go away. So now I took those 20 images okay. and the first crack at it is just to average them. If I average them, most of the images don't have it and we start reducing the, uh, reducing the, the, the streaks. And you can see in this image, which is the average of the 20 frames, the only one thing you really see is, is the remnants of that, that airplane landing light. Yeah, I can see that, that dashed white line going so, from upper left to lower so, right in the left corner there. Yeah. So pretty quickly, digital gets us a long way there pretty quickly, pretty easily. Okay. Uh, the next one is called a, uh, a median combine. Uh, there we go. So this case, instead of averaging the 20 frames, we took the median of, of the frame. So each, every pixel in this frame, we found the medium value, median. Uh, and that essentially makes, makes the streaks go by. Now, there's some reasons why you don't want to use median combined. It's not as effective in, in improving the signal to noise ratio. We can get into lots of details here. Um, but in today's world, we have even better techniques. Uh, this pixel rejection techniques. Um, and so now here's, here's the image of those 20 frames using the pixel rejection. And this is a, um, a statistical technique and it's looking for those outlier pixels. That, those streaks only go through one frame. If I look at all 20 frames, one of them is hot and the other ones aren't. So it makes them go away. And so what, we get rid of the streaks and then I can produce what's called a pixel rejection map. And hopefully we'll get that up here on the screen. Um, Which is, it just takes that out and does it replace right. it with black or? Well, what it's gonna do is when it replaces, instead of, in, of, 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 of averaging, there we go. Um, instead of averaging 20 frames, it only averaged, say, 19 of those in, in this case. Okay. So you can see on this pixel rejection map now, all the things that were rejected from the images I took. You can see the two, the airplane landing lights. You can see the Starlink satellite. You can see the other satellites going on a diagonal and the other ones. And it's also the other stuff that we talked about earlier about what else can get in there. You can see down where I uh, labeled it as a cosmic ray. There was a, there's a bright streak there. That's a cosmic ray hit that hit my, hit my detector. Uh, the, I stopped imaging at 20 because clouds rolled in. Hey, guess what? This is Michigan. <laughs> yeah, there you and go. And that last frame no had, surprise. Yeah. had some clouds going through and that routine actually started to take out some of the stuff from, from, the, uh, from so the clouds. the routine calculates the, if you take the same pixel in each one of the 20 frames and average that together, you come up with an average value, and then it measures for each individual frame, how far does that pixel deviate from the average? And if it doesn't deviate much, it keeps it. And if it deviates a lot, it gets rid of it. Okay. Okay. Right. Now just, just to show that th this happens all the time, I'm gonna show some, an image from another one of uh, the astronomers in the air, Ani Hafid. Um, and this is one of his images he took last summer which was taken before Starlink got in, into the into the game. Okay. So I, I uh, we were trying to decide what this where we second this image, but here's his stack from his one one night of imaging down at Lake Hudson. For those in the Detroit area, you know Lake Hudson is a dark great sky spot site. To go. Sure. Mm -hmm. So here's his image, and if we now go to the next frame, it's his image rejection link. So this is the stuff that got rejected out of his his images in one evening of of, of observing last summer. Oh I mean, goodness. it's, it's kind of like modern art here, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, so having streaks go through our images is, um, is nothing new. Okay. And, and so my, my initial reaction was, you know, all right, we deal with this all the time. So this is no big deal. So that's the kind of the good news of this. Okay. Okay. But what's the bad news? Well, let me, let me talk about some other things people have been talking about. One of the things I've heard mentioned was that these bright satellites are going to burn out detectors. And I, I kind of got set back by this. So, um, so let me, let, let's bring up the, the next image of an, uh, uh, what happens when you overexpose a pixel, an image, the charge actually overflows and, and gets down and, and bleeds off to ground or into, the, into adjacent pixels. If, this is an image I took of the Helix Nebula uh, using a 20 inch t a telescope. And, it's, uh, and if you look at the stars, you'll see some, besides the diffraction spikes, let's go to the next frame. There's something called blooming, 
and on this kind of a chip, that excess charge when it's overexposed, the charge actually bleeds off into the into the next DJ uh, okay. in that column. Yeah. And so it can't damage the, 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 the imagers. And, and just to beat this horse to death, if we go to the next one, uh, this is a Hubble image. <laughs> and so now you can see even Hubble detector is being, you can see that blooming coming out of that, that oh, yeah. star out of that Hubble image. So, so it doesn't burn a hole it, in the It's not going to burn a hole, so that, that's, that's not, not going to be an issue at all. Uh, so in, in your considered opinions, gentlemen, your conclusions about this? Well, like mm -hmm. I started to say, I think, thought initially that it should be easy to mitigate. But, but when you start thinking about, I did some quick back of the envelope, and uh, if we got 50,000 satellites in there, my calculations say that we're going to have, if, if you took uh, a one square degree of the sky, mm -hmm. which, is, which is four moons kind of stacked, stacked up against the other, yeah. that, that's about a third of a satellite. So just go a little bit bigger than that, and it says every s stretch of sky is going to have a satellite in it. And, and that now starts to become a you know, big satellite. Yeah. Um, still, for us amateurs, especially if they're in the dark, they're not going to hurt. But if you're a professional and you're trying to measure the characteristics of a star or a faint galaxy, and, and you got these satellites going through, and, they, and they, uh, they can mess up your images. You can mess up your calculations. Okay. So, so yeah. there's still time of day and location uh, okay. that, that you, you have to play with. Um, there are certain ob objects that we can only image at certain times of the year. Um, so again, when they're completely behind the Earth and completely in shadow, they're not an issue. And that will be most of the time. But those fringe times, uh, they're going to be problematic. Uh, again, software can sort of deal with that and reduce mm -hmm. the problem, but it's just going to be a little more obnoxious. For us amateurs. Yeah. Again, a professional, if, they, if their data gets corrupted because a non-visible satellite passed through, that, that's, that's going to be an issue right. for them. And if they're autonomous and they don't really know where they're going to be, they can't plan for them. I want to thank you both for being on the show today to bring this uh, to our viewers' mm -hmm. attention. I've, for the average person, it, it's probably not going to be a big deal, but for the amateur astronomer community, community could be an issue. Uh, if you'd like to visit our website for the Ford Amateur Astronomy Club, the, uh, the link for that is down at the bottom of the screen. And coming up next to round out this month's show with What's Up in the Night Sky, Stephen. What's Up in the Night Sky for March 2020? The sun rises from 5.34 in the morning to 5.40 in the morning over the course of the month and sets from 6.23 p.m. to 7.58 p.m. So the days are getting longer. Astronomical night starts an hour and a half before sunrise. Uh, actually, it ends an hour and a half before sunrise and then starts an hour and a half after sunset. Now this month, remember, March 8th is daylight savings time, spring forward. And also, the spring equinox, which is a real astronomical event, is on March 19th. Now, the moons, which we have right here, starts with uh, the, full mo the th first quarter on March 2nd. And uh, then we have the full moon on March 9th. We have the third quarter on March 16th. And we have, on March 22nd, 24th, uh, the new moon, which you don't see. Mercury starts off in Aquarius. This is Aquarius, here's Mercury, and uh, it rises uh, from 633 to 631, doesn't change that much over the course of the month, and it goes from magnitude 3.1, which is fairly bright, to 0 0.1, which is quite bright, uh, over the course of the month. Now here we are on the 22nd, at 6.45 a.m. Mercury is very close to the sun. This, this line basically points to the sun. And so um, uh, 6.45, at least for Dearborn, Michigan, this is a, a really good time. Your timing should be fairly close, but not necessarily that close. Um, maximum western elongation is March 23rd. And, and it happens to be also when Mar uh, Mercury is farthest visually from Earth away from the sun, 27.8 degrees. Aphelion is two days later, uh, is uh, 27.5 degrees. So it's not as 
far away from the sun from our perspective. Uh, we have Ceres here. Um, it's not as bright as Mercury by a long shot, uh, but it is something that's in the, in the field of view here. Then we have a bunch of things. We have Mars here in Sagittarius, and um, Mars goes from, um, uh, rises at 4, 4.08 in the morning to 4.28 in the morning. The Earth is catching up, so it doesn't go that far. And it goes from mag, uh, magnitude 1.1 to magnitude 0 0.8. It's getting um, brighter as the Earth gets closer to it. Mars and Pluto here are very close together, but Pluto is very hard to see in binoculars, so you probably won't catch, catch them both in, uh, in a shot. Now, Jupiter here has all of these, these lines. These are the uh, orbits of the various moons of Jupiter. Uh, anyway, so Jupiter is here in Sagittarius also. Saturn goes from Sagittarius to Capricornus, that's the goat here, over the course of the month. Rises from 408 to 4, oh, see, no, rises from 514 to 424 and stays at magnitude 0 0.7, which is pretty bright over the course of the month. Pluto is in Sagittarius all month, where all year really, rises at 505 to 409. That's entirely, almost entirely, the, uh, the uh, Earth's going around the sun, uh, you know, and so you, you have uh, a couple of hours there. And, it, and it's uh, magnitude 14.1 to 13.15, which is a 10-inch telescope. At the end of the month, maybe an 8-inch telescope. In, on March 1st at 9 p.m., we have Venus. And Venus goes from Pisces to Taurus. It sets at 10.09 p.m. Um, and it goes from an extremely bright Magnitude minus 4.1 to magnitude minus 4.3, even brighter. It has its maximum eastern elongation, that is its farthest from the sun, so basically up at the top here, on March 24th. Now, you can see Uranus up here, right? Um, it's in Aries, uh, and it sets at... Uh, 10.42 to 9.52 over the month, and um, it goes from magnitude 5.8 to 5.9, so it's getting dimmer, but um, magnitude 6 is considered the dimmest thing that you can see naked eye. So if you get to, out to a dark sky site and you have a really good sky chart so you know which dot is Uranus, you could possibly see it with just your eyeballs which would be kind of cool. I've done that in October. I thought it was easier at that time of year. Now, Neptune is in superior conjunction on the 8th of March, and we are not going to see Neptune at all. It'll be behind the sun. And that is what's up in the night sky for March 2020. Remember, we don't charge for this show, but we may tax your brain.